Manchester's indie rock and roll station. Excess Manchester. The Excess Manchester Long Player. An iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester. Hello, I'm Jim and this is The Excess Long Player, another interview with an artist about one of their classic albums and today it is a briote, a stunner of an album as we go deep on Glas Vegas' self-titled debut album, <laughs> Glas Vegas. I don't know why I felt like I need to say the name of the album I've just told you it's self-titled. Anyway, it's Glas Vegas by Glas Vegas. Confession time before we go into this chat with frontman James Allen. This is one of those albums that I remember from when it came out back in 2008, but I don't think I'd sat down and listened to it all the way through until I knew I was going to be speaking to James about this album. When I did, absolutely blown away by it. It'd been so long since I heard it, instantly went and bought the full album on vinyl, which is a whole different experience. So hopefully listening to this podcast inspires you to go back and rediscover this Mercury Music Prize nominated album. I'm speaking to James Allen from Las Vegas about their eponymous debut. How you doing, James? Good to see you. Good to see you. How you doing? Yeah, I'm not too bad. You're looking well, mate. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to getting into this chat about your debut album, Las Vegas. But before I talk about that, one of the things I never knew until I started looking at a few of your previous interviews and your old interviews and getting stuck into this album, that you once had a career pre-band as a pro footballer what was it that made you decide to sack off the football and go into the music instead oasis purely oasis oasis i it was like the first person that made me think that i should spend my own money on music was uh bruce springsteen when it was um, the streets of philadelphia and then the first band that made me commit to buying an album like spending all that money on a full album was pulp different class but it was Oasis that made me know that oh, I'm going to be in a band. Me and my cousin, the guitar player, uh, Rab, when we saw Oasis, that was it. We knew, oh, that's what we're going to do. And it's funny because I'd been, well, like, football was my life, you know. Mm. And um, I'd just signed, um, you know, we had a team by Falkirk and I left school. And that was me, a professional footballer. And it was just at that time then. Then I decided that I was going to be in a band and be just like Oasis, you know what I mean? It's not a bad couple of options to have, is it? Rock and roll or football, it's like... Well, that's the thing, I'd been, when I'd been doing football, that was my life. So then anybody that knew me were just like, what, you're going to be in a band? But you've just signed professional. And it's, it's one of those things that I, I, I'm glad it did happen, but at the time, you know what I mean? Sometimes mm. if you just in love with somebody or something you, it's like you can't help it it wasn't the best timing but could just work to it like that but um and i guess you know it's like with anything but especially with football music it's like you need to be lucky you know hmm. and I, I didn't really consider any of the things you know what i mean but um i it was i thought i'd just be in a band and we would have songs just like oasis and when i started writing the first album I, you know, I wanted to have songs just like Oasis and just be like be like them. Mm. But then the songs never worked out like that. You know, they worked out like our first album because I never knew that what the band was going to be was like going to be like some kind of vehicle or some kind of platform for me um, expressing things, parts of my personality. You know what I mean? Like um, things that I would fear, things I would hope for, things I would dream about, things I would um, regret and all that would just be in the music. I just thought we were going to have cigarettes and alcohol and, and all the other, live forever or something. It's funny when you're younger and you don't know these things and you're just getting quite blind Yeah, yeah. to something, you know what I mean? But aye, that was what a lot of the first album is. It's just a lot of my memories of it is, is the first writing their songs, their first songs, you know. It's interesting you mentioned Oasis. I've heard you talk about Oasis before being an influence, and I always wondered whether it was a musical influence or whether it was that. Because I think Oasis, they kind of inspired a generation and not necessarily inspired a generation to go and be musicians, but it was the first music that for a lot of people, it kind of spoke to them and it kind of said, look, you can do what you want to do. You don't have to be a labourer or whatever it is. You can kind of follow your dreams. That was kind of the, the Oasis message. So I was wondering whether it was a, a musical influence or whether it was a 
know, get up a go and do what you want to do. I was probably aiming for the stars and and hit Glasgow. You know, I mean, like I hit (laughs) somewhere. You know, because it was like that's the thing with music and art. It's like it's like the idea tells you how it's going to be, Mm. and you can try and like you know dress it up a bit. It will just it will take you where it's going to take you, and that well, that's what it seemed like it done with us. And if you let your garden and let instinct kind of take you, and that always seemed to be the way for our band, but I, I wouldn't think there was any connection musically. Mm. You know, I mean, we toured with Oasis and all that, and, and I'm still in touch with Noel, you know what I mean, and then like quite regularly. Because I love it when he's on talk sport talking, it's, like, it's really good talking with the fat boys, funny. But I don't, I don't know what they ever thought. They were probably just like, what is that? Because I seen that we were playing the gigs, Noel would be at one side, Liam would be at the other side of the stage, watching every night. And they probably were just thinking, what the hell is that? That noise? That's the thing, like, you know, I I would have liked to have I would have liked for us to have songs like the Bee Gees and stuff, but it just, that's not us. I don't think musically it is. But there must have been something when I seen them on the TV playing mm. music, that it was something that made me understand what what was going to be in my future. Not like a permanent, not like some kind of like vision or something. But in a way, maybe a touch, like just oh, this this is what my future's going to be like, this. I'm going to sound like my auntie here, you know what I mean? Because she's quite, like, into the signs and into the stars and all that. But, aye, but it was, it was important. It's funny, that, because you would think then that, that it would be a connection just with the music, but it's no. I don't think it is. I mean, in terms of the sound of the album, and this might be something that's occurred to me because I live in Manchester, and I think Manchester and Glasgow are quite similar cities in a lot of ways, like post-industrial towns, great big cultural hubs now. But I think as a record, Glas Vegas, it kind of sounds like Glasgow in terms of it. It's sometimes yeah. dour, it's sometimes uplifting, it's sometimes grey, it's sometimes beautiful. How, how much of your surroundings do you think influenced the creation of this record? Uh, more than probably what I would ever know. I think at the end of the album with the song Ice Cream Fan, I think that is... Still, if I hear it at any point, that's one that I can see my, I can I can really see clearly my childhood, like sitting on the pavement, sitting on the concrete, and when you put your hands back and you're sitting on the, and all the, the, the way that concrete feels and the way the sky looks, you know, sometimes if you smell something and it takes you back to your time, you know, it's like, I guess music does that for people as well, but with that song, I, I can see my childhood and when I when I can feel it that strongly then I know that everybody would aim for that when they're making music. You know everybody wants to aim to, you know, see their childhood and all that. But when I can feel it that strongly then it, there must have been something that in the music that was that was quite accurate or that was that was just right, you know what I mean? Mm. There was something that we we pulled off, you know, we achieved something with that because it does make me see my childhood quite clearly, you know. I mean, this was a record that sounded nothing like anything else that was released around 2009, I don't think. And you mentioned Oasis being an influence, but not necessarily in terms of directly using their music as an influence. What were you listening to? I mean, the obvious comparison I think is made a lot is the kind of Wall of Sound, Phil Spector stuff. But what were you uh, kind of digesting that was flowing out into your music? Um, a lot of 50s do and rock and roll. I'm kind of like an encyclopedia for all that kind of thing. But Phil Spector was, it was Rab that had a box set and there was one night where I was using these power cards for the house that I'd moved into. I'd nowhere to stay at the time, you know what I mean? I moved into that. I was in this house and there, there was no electricity and stuff. And um, I was sitting there with this, like, you know what I mean, like a bag with clothes and this box set, but no electricity. And I managed to get the electricity cards and all that and get the thing back on and... So I think that the joy of just having electricity in the house and having this box set and playing the box set, it was just like, it was something that, it was just a great memory for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, again, like the Oasis thing, I, a part of it was that I could, maybe more musically, but, but I could see my future in that. I think it's a blend of the sounds and stuff that wasn't as separated from the other music that I'd heard. I mean, because if you go for like the 63, period with like Be My Baby and all that but if you just like maybe a year or two on and even the Righteous Brothers with 
you've lost that love and feeling and Unchained Melody and then they had the song Ebb Tide. And I think Ebb Tide is the, I think that was Phil Spector's peak. There's something there that is just, you know, when, it, when it's pushed to the the maximum, to the extreme of what you'd call the wall of sound. But the wall of sound, but you can hear everything so clearly, you know. It's just like a massive, massive painting with lots and lots of small details, you know. Mm. And um, I think that was that was just a, it was a glorious kind of thing when I was first... You know, it's like when you've not seen such a classic movie and then you, you get to experience it for the first time. It was like that kind of, with that, with that box set. But I think that, that it, uh, some of the band maybe being, like, different probably came through, like, the limitations as well and inexperience, I think. I mean, I, I didn't know why a kick drum was a kick drum. I didn't know why a snare was a snare when I was writing the first songs and... So I think that even having an understanding through listening to that those were like, amazing songs, you know, like Be My Baby, if you're listening to Be My Baby, the drum beat at the beginning, it was like Daddy's Gone at the beginning. It's that same thing, you know. And that was so that was that was good for me to lean on that. Richie Costi came in to produce the album, who was a producer who had a bit of a reputation for doing things differently, for making different sounds in the studio, for using different techniques. Do you think he helped you give the album that feel of something that wasn't like everything else that was doing the rounds at the time? I think we helped him with that. Okay. I think what he helped us with was probably there was something there was something between what what, what our band was, what our songs, what like the arrangement in our songs, and his understanding knowledge of how to make something just like blow you away sound wise i mean some of the things when he was doing in the studio i'd never really heard music you can maybe feel that when the band's playing live but but no when you're just listening to music coming from a speaker there was something that would just hit you in a different way and i i, I guess now and again if i hear any of the songs i still feel that like it's more cheating heart when when it when it comes in with the guitar part, there's something about it that just kind of takes my breath away, kind of thing. But music normally doesn't really take my breath away in that way. And that was, a part of that was rich. Right. Uh, there's certain things that he'd that he done that I've never, I've never heard any producer do with any band, you know? Only he knows, I guess, why or how. I, I think he knows how, how that was, but why that was. Aye, but he's... Um, He's a cool guy, so he has a like. Uh, we, we got on really good. Get good memories, like hanging out with him and all that. And he uh, was the right kind of personality for us at the time as well. I think you know. One of the other people that was involved from the beginning of this album or the beginning of your success as a band was obviously Alan McGee. And given the Oasis connections, early doors, and your feelings towards them, how did it feel to have? the Creation Records boss, kind of taking an interest and putting his influence into the band? I, I need to take myself back to that time because obviously over the years to now, it's like, you know, just like family kind of thing. Yeah. And it's not that it's no as big a deal and all that because I love the guy and all that, but, but I guess at the time when I'd first met him, in, in some ways, like, the, the things were quite surreal, were just exactly the way it was supposed to be. You know, so that apparently all the things that happened with the band, like with Alan and all the different other things, it was um, partly it was just like what's happening. But then the other fifty percent is like, no, this is the way I dreamt it. I've seen this. I've seen this so many times because I've I dreamt it to be like this. So this is normal. You know, so it's mm. a bit of both. But it was, he's a different kind of personality as well. He's a unique kind of guy. He sees things from a, a different angle for like most other people. And a lot of the time when I think something's not very good, when I think a gig's not been very good, he'll think the opposite. When I think a song's good and when we've played good, he'll think the opposite. He'll see it in a different way. And it kind of makes sense that he does see things different. He just sees things different for other people, you know what I mean? But it was really encouraging in those days. You know, like the songs like uh, Geraldine and Daddy's Gone and It's My Cheating Heart and all that, when it, when I first recorded them, that's when we were first getting like, fret, we were becoming friends, you know, and 
and I would just send him, like, the if I recorded the demo, and I, oh, I've wrote this song, Geraldine, and I would send him the, a wee recording of it, and, and he would phone up, and he would say a lot of things that that are probably not, like, true. So he would say, oh, this is, like, this is a genius song, and you're a genius songwriter, and all this kind of thing. And I think I'm the kind of personality that even if it's not true, then it's like, it will still make me throw the stone further yeah. the next time than what I would have if you'd have told me the truth and says it's a good song or whatever. <laughs> so I, it was a, a lot of the things, it was like, um, I don't mean to say what well, friendship was good for my momentum as a songwriter, but it was. But there was a lot of other advantages as well and good things about positive things about it. You know, I love the guy, you know. I want to talk about two moments of the album that I've picked to have a chat about. I'd like you to pick one as well. So have a think about it. It could be a highlight, a low light, a specific memory from a song or a recording session, whatever you like. We'll get onto that in a moment. But first, the two bits I want to talk about is actually one of my favourite bits on the whole album is at the end of the first track where it kind of shifts into a rendition of You Are My Sunshine before it, it kind of like merges into the intro of track number two. What was the thinking about kind of putting that at the end of track number one? I'm not actually sure why. Um, <laughs> Just why liked it. it. <laughs> actually, when I, when I actually wrote the song and wrote the when I recorded the demo, I'm, I'm sure it was like that on the demo. I'm sure it was, but it almost like it was just like a a part that was it was it was almost like a part of the song that was just it was just probably the same reasons that I would like think oh this word this should be the words, and then I used you are my sunshine at the the end of the. I don't know, a lot of it's just um, instinct. It's what you do when you're writing songs, I guess. It's just like your your instinct and your personality is just like, this is the way it's supposed to be, boom, that's that, you know? It's incredible um, you kind of say something like that because my assumption was, and this is, this is one of the great things about music, I guess, is you hear a song and you interpret it in the way that you want to interpret it and it might not be the way that the songwriter intended it initially because given the context of that song and it being written about a young man losing his life before his time, I assumed it was kind of like a reference to almost like the innocence of childhood and it was that kind of musical reference. But I guess that's the point, isn't it? Like, people can interpret it how they like. I know. And some people, like, like the Whitney, I mean, like, the, I don't know for when I wrote that song and what it meant to me. For me to put any other song with that, there's not much that I could put with that. I couldn't have touched that with anything, but I could only touch it with something like You're My Sunshine. But then I guess some people would maybe hear You're My Sunshine and, and hear it in a different way from someone else, you know? Because even if I hear that song on its own, You're My Sunshine, you know, sometimes you'll just hear it like in a, somewhere, you know, you'll just hear it on a radio, you hear it on a, like an advert or sort of something, then it still hits me. Mm. The, the, powerful and how how sad it is you know so but then not everybody would hear it like that you know some of the things that I find quite sad or find quite happy is maybe not the usual things that somebody would find happy or or some of the things that I find funny or really not funny that's kind of disturbing for some people probably like you know but I I just thought oh this is the way it's supposed to be one of the other tracks I want to talk about quickly is Stabbed, which I think is a really interesting track to have on any album, not least a debut album, because I think it's challenging to put spoken word on anything that you want to be successful because it's just not kind of accepted. Does that speak about your intention for this LP to be a piece of art rather than just an album? <sighs> I mean, to me, it was almost like, it was so obvious that that was what I was supposed to do. It was almost like a pop, it's not like a pop song, right? But to me, it kind of I was in a way. It was just, um, I mean, for Stabbed with the, uh, with the music, I heard the music, I was walking down the street one night um, at Charing Cross in the town, and it must have been somebody with a window open and listening to it. And I, when I heard it coming out, and... And I just imagined that's what I was saying with it. I mean, look, the more I talk here, the more you get to realise that I'm crazy. 
you know. <laughs> who would do that? You know what I mean? Who would do that? Only a crazy person. But that was that was how that came about. And I made a little demo of it that was with that music. And I tried it a couple of other ways, but when I tried it that way then it was like that made that made the most 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 sense, you know, with the Beethoven thing, you know. But that that was why when you were talking about memories and stuff, that's that was one of my favourite memories, uh, making the album. There was something about it that felt like, you know, if you were to write a bunch of songs and they didn't really mean anything or they didn't, then if you went on tour and you're playing like Chicago on a Tuesday night or something and you you I would need to feel like whether it's somebody would like it or somebody wouldn't like it, they would need to feel like there's a reason for me to actually be there doing it or even being mm. in the studio to make an album. It would just would wouldn't feel right to be in a studio and it's not something that feels like it feels like me, feels like us. It needs to feel like that quite strongly. And I think that when we were doing that song, the piano player was a guy called uh, as a guy called Paul Cantalon, who I knew his wife and I met them. Like I saw Paul playing the night before for the first time. It was I went to some charity event in Lower East Side in New York, and 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 it was like you know it was like. Um, all these different things that they were selling for charity, like um, Debbie Harry photographs and stuff and prints and all that kind of thing. And, and Paul was playing with Angela, and he was playing the piano. And I thought, like, I wonder if... Cause I, I don't know what my plan was, because I knew that I was going to have the piano, like, doing the Beethoven thing, but I'd not actually planned on, like, how we're going to, how we're going to do it. Then Paul, I'd say to him that night, asked him if he would come and play it and stuff and he came down to the studio so when he was in the studio like playing it and then I was speaking the words it made me feel like oh there's a good purpose there's a reason why I'm in the band mm. we're in New York and I'm saying these things saying these things in a way that is that's quite far from New York you know what I mean it's, it's East End of Glasgow and, and this is the way it should have always been it was something quite romantic about it Something quite beautiful about it, and uh, that was one of my one of my favourite memories. One of my favourite memories was watching someone else play who's not actually in the band. <laughs> Sorry, everybody else who's in the band. <laughs> um, you say, I mean, you sound like you're very instinctive in terms of your music. You kind of get a feel for what's right, and you go with it. Did anyone try and talk you out of? that approach at some point because I can imagine a label boss coming in and listening to Stabbed and going nah that, that can't be on a debut album stick it on a B-side at some point but you're not having that on the album I well Rich suggested he suggested that we, we'd done it in a different way because we'd done like there was another recording where it was it was a bit different it was like, like you know just different <laughs> well I was singing it and all that kind of thing and I can't even remember what I said, but we were all sitting and um, he suggested that and I said, nah, we'll just do it like this kind of thing, you know. That was that. I think there was talk before the album came out about Stab not being on the album, just as it was going to get, uh, when it was mastered and it was just ready to get pr like pressed or whatever. Somebody had suggested that somebody had been stabbed in London and this wouldn't look good and all that. and But the... The label were, well, they were all right. They, they, they were, it's not the way you would imagine it where they're like evil and they're trying to like, you know, like sometimes your aunties and your uncles or your embarrassing parents, they'll, they'll just try and suggest something to you. But it's not because they're trying to like, mm. they've not got some like, um, they, they don't like hate art and they're trying to get in the way of art to try and make something plastic for the, it's not like that. It's just that they're trying to like suggest something so that, that you don't like trip up, you yeah. know what I mean? But you just say, no, what calm down, it'll be alright. And you just you kinda just go with the way you're gonna do it, you know what I mean? But I there's a couple of people that suggested. I think to us, to the band, they've you know, we were always quite like no brazen, well no we we were just quite quite sure. Right. Well quite sure. But I mean Rab, he's always been sure. Since day one, and not even just with the band, just like in environments that you shouldn't be that sure, you know. 
I remember him taking an amp back to the an amplifier back to the shop. He got this orange amplifier. It's one of the Mexican amplifier, and then and he took it back, and it was the best one that they had in the shop. And the guy was just like, "You're returning it," and he was like, "Mm hmm." And I was watching him because I didn't really know what to say. I don't really know the kind of technical whatever. And he was like, ah, yeah, I'm returning it. And the guy was like, why? And it was like, you know, in the, in the like a record shop or a guitar shop, it's like, there's always a feeling that they know more and you don't know anything. You know, that's always a feeling that you get kind of thing. And I'd just seen Rab, it was just like, Rab looked a bit hung off feet tall and he was just like, why am I returning it? Because it's shite. <laughs> and it was just his certainty that just blew the guy. It was like, almost like I could see the guy's hair blowing back and he was like... <laughs> Pinned against the wall, and I was just looking at him. I was just like admiring how how sure he was that that amp was crap. You know what I mean? The best one that they had. But also, if he doesn't like something, he'll tell you as well. Mm-hmm. He would, he would, he would, he would tell me. You, you know where you start. You know where you stand with him. You know what I mean? But and so for their songs, that album, it was like when you were sitting with other people there, they were like, "This is the right thing." And when everybody's like that, it must, that must add, because I'd imagine that some bands it's not like that, you know, where they'll be like maybe some sure, some kind of sure, some really sure, whereas with us it was just like, this is the beginning and this is the end of music, our album, and before and after, this is it, this is the main thing, this is the most important thing, this is the right thing, your record. So I think there was a certain kind of confidence as well that, must have helped. Is there another moment or memory that you'd like to kind of call back on from the creation of the album? Probably, I remember when I was singing the first song, which was the first song that we were doing for the album was a song called Sad Light. And I remember when I tried to sing it, because we'd done some of the instruments and stuff, and we'd done some live stuff with all the band playing and all that, and then I tried to sing the song. And I remember it just, I just didn't feel like it was good. And I remember walking home from the studio that night and I went over it and over it in my head and it was just like, we're done, we're, we're finished. I won't be able to sing these songs and the band is, we should just stop. We shouldn't make the album. And this is a bit like being younger and probably it's just anxiety that's just like, it's funny how you can convince yourself of something though mm. and it's how you can convince yourself that it should all self-destruct man and just like that's it it must just be the there must just be a certain standard or there's a certain way that you way that you you're trying to achieve something and then it's not going to meet that and then that's it you should just stop and then i went to my bed and then the next day we went back in the studio i still felt the same and then it was uh, Rich who said, like, you know, like instead of singing in the, sh- the room in the studio with the, all the instruments and stuff, he says, why don't you just come in here with the control thing and I'll just set up the microphone right here kind of thing and we'll just sit here, I'll sit here and then you can sing. And, um, and I thought, right, I'll try that then. And when I sang it, uh, it was, everything just felt different. Everything was possible. You know what I mean? Anything was possible. Yeah. So it was one extreme to the other. And when I looked at Richie's face and I was just like, was that, was that all right kind of thing? And when I looked at his face, he just kind of smiled and he was like, that, the way he'd done it was just like really good. He was just like smiling, oh, that, that is, that is good. And I, I could tell that he did think it was good, you know. And then from that, it was just momentum right through to the end of the album then, you know. I just stood next to the the desk kind of thing oh, and good. done all the vocals there kind of thing, you know what I mean? But I, I remember that and it's, it's, try, it's like, you know, some, cause sometimes along the way there's been moments like that. When we played the David Letterman programme and I thought it was so bad, I thought we should just quit, we shouldn't be a band anymore. You know, it was just the worst thing ever. And it was in that theatre, the you know, that had all the great bands like the Beatles and all that when they first went to America and, and we just went in and just ruined everything. You know, and then I saw it back years later, and I thought it was really good. I don't know what the hell I was thinking. You know <laughs> what I mean? But it's 
Aye, uh, so I've kind of tried to remind myself of that along the way to like yeah. just shut up and just like give it five minutes and see if I feel a bit different about things, you know. How do you feel looking back in general at this album? Undoubtedly a success, 56,000 copies in its first week, number two in the charts, Mercury Music Prize, I already mentioned, a load of other award nominations and awards as well. But at the same time, I think all musicians are like this to a certain extent, but I think you maybe more than most is you're a fan of progression and you want to move things forward. So are you able to look back and kind of enjoy the early stuff as much or do you listen to it and go, oh, I wish we'd done this differently or I wish we'd changed this or I wish we'd tweaked this? Can you look at it afresh now? I've, I've not heard it for a while. There's not really that... I, but, but, but my memory is from hearing it is there's not really a lot I could have imagined. I could have imagined maybe this or this a bit different, but I don't, th- I don't think it would make it any better. If anything, maybe I would make it worse. You know, if I was to, if I was able to change anything, I, I'm really, I just feel lucky, I guess, that even that I was involved in it. Mm. I'd feel, I feel lucky that even the artwork and all that, when I see the artwork and it all seemed like perfect, you know, like the way I, I would have wanted it to turn out. I don't really know how I feel about it. Like, um, I'm proud, I guess. If I was really to ask myself, that, like, I guess I would feel proud. But there's a part of me because because I'm still making music that it's just like, it's just like almost a part of something that's still ongoing. So it's just like a part of this, with the story almost, you know? Um, yeah. I feel lucky that you would be asking me questions about it years later, or that people would say stuff, you know, about the album that is, that what, what things mean to them and all that. And I feel lucky to, to be a part of it, you know? James, it's a pleasure to talk to you about it. It's a stunning album. It's one I've not listened to in its entirety probably for over a decade and just coming back to it and rediscovering it from start to finish. It's just a beautiful album. So appreciate you speaking to me on the Excess Long Player. You mentioned you're still doing stuff. What's the current status of Glas Vegas? Is that solo stuff? Is there a new album on the way at some point? Hi, well, we just played Barcelona a couple of days ago. That was really amazing, really great. And well, we're bringing out an album of demos from the last album. The last album was called Godspeed and this album's called Oddspeed. Um, right. So it's like a, a bunch of demos that are kind of like a window into the, the making of the last album and there's like a cover. I heard that like, I was in Tesco one day and I was walking out and I heard this song, Rush Hour, uh, that was like a, a 80s pop song kind of thing. But I just imagined oh, we, we should be I should sing this song. Uh, so thanks, Tesco. Um, <laughs> they want commission uh, now. You shouldn't but, have said that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and um, uh, it was just, it's, it's, I guess it's just like I went into the, the years where I was learning how to make an album myself and and um, the different sort of, uh, maybe the way that a song would be in its early stages and then the way it would end up being maybe on the album, you know, it's that, that thing. And we're going to be touring the, we're touring Europe in like autumn time, and that will be like uh, the album we're talking about, the debut album. We'll be playing that like start to finish, like you know, in different countries like Belgium, Sweden, Amazing. Denmark, and all that. So we were saying about earlier about I I feel lucky to be part of it, and and obviously doing things like this, it's great. James, really appreciate your time. Thanks for talking to us on the XS Long Player. Thank you. The XS Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in fall with Jim Salverson. XS Manchester. Awesome to speak to James about their debut album, Glas Vegas. Really enjoyed the chat and really enjoyed rediscovering the album as well. If you want to go back in the timeline and check out some of the previous artists that have appeared on the XS Long Player discussing their classic albums and there's loads to go at even if we just go down the scottish music route for a moment we've got interviews with carl faulkner from the view about hats off to the buskers the chat i had with alex Capranos about franz ferdinand's debut album is one of my favorite one of these podcasts ever and i really enjoyed sitting down with fran healy and dougie payne from travis about the invisible band as well just a handful 
of previous episodes of this pod that you can go and discover and find out some stories that maybe you'd not heard before about your favourite albums. Don't forget to do all the things that you get told to do on podcasts. Make sure you're following and you'll get a notification when the next episode of the podcast is ready. Make sure you've rated and reviewed. Not many people have done that, so if you've not done it yet, go give us a five-star review wherever you're listening because it helps other people discover the pod. But most importantly, come back soon for another Excess Long Play. The Excess Manchester Long Player, an iconic album in full with Jim Salverson. Excess Manchester.